Hey everybody, what's up? Thanks for checking in. It's your brother Matthew here. Uh, if you're new or visiting, I'm one of the pastors at Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're looking for a church like that, you found one. Come check us out in real life. All right. I'm polishing up a little bit of a mini-series here on this YouTube channel about pastoral vocation and uh, calling. So in recent times, and I'm releasing some of these videos a couple days apart here, I did a video about mistakes that young pastors make. I have a video coming out about mistakes that older veteran pastors make. I have a video just about to come out of if you feel called but you're not sure what you're called to. That's going to come out. Today, I'm going to do a little video here called Don't Be a Pastor If. All right. So I want to try to stop some of you from making lifelong poor decisions by going into pastoral vocation, pastoral ministry, pastoral calling, if in fact you are not qualified to be that. And uh, you're going to save yourself a lot of pain. You're going to save your wife a lot of pain if there's no real calling on you or if you're not biblically qualified to be a pastor. Uh, you're going to save whatever potential church that you may try to serve in a lot of pain if I can steer you away from it. Somebody once said, I forget who said it, uh, that if you could do anything else with your life besides being a pastor, you should probably do that thing. Just because the calling to pastoral life is so narrow that it's not something that you should try to squeeze yourself into like a square peg in a round hole. Uh, let the guys who are truly called of God do the work that God has assigned. There's nothing wrong of course, with having a, a non-pastoral or non-ministry, non-full-time ministry vocation. You can support your family. You can love your wife. You can love the church in a whole lot of ways, but you don't have to be a pastor. Now, thankfully, we have in the pastoral letters of Paul some very clear qualifications as to who should be a pastor and who is disqualified from being a pastor. One of the reasons that I love being Presbyterian is that you don't make that decision by yourself. You just don't decide, you know what, I'm going to ordain myself as a pastor. You have the session of the local church, you have the presbytery to determine these things and help to sift out whether or not your calling is legitimate. So I'm very thankful for that. Non-denominational or Baptistic churches don't necessarily have those safeguards, which is one of the reasons I'm not non-denominational, nor am I Baptistic. I'm thankful for the work of the Presbytery. So Paul gives us some instruction in a couple of different places, in 1 Timothy as well as in the book of Titus, the latter of which we are going to look at right now. Now, I'm not going to uh, do an exegesis of this entire text, but there's two words that I want to pull out here to highlight for you and give you four things that I think are disqualifying of a would-be pastoral uh, hopeful. And I want to steer you away from pastoral ministry if these things would seem to describe you. So let me go ahead and put this text up on the screen here. Paul writing, he says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-disciplined, self-controlled, I should say, upright, holy, and disciplined. So I want to focus in here a little bit on the word self-controlled and the word disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Okay, so again, I want to focus on the word self-controlled here as well as the word disciplined. And let me give you then four, I think, disqualifying attributes for a pastor. And if any of these describe you, please don't be offended. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm not trying to pinch your fingers in the car door here. I'm just telling you that you're going to save yourself, your family, and your would-be church a lot of pain. First, if you are a slacker, you are disqualified from the pastoral office. Why do I say that? Well, because he just said that you have to be disciplined here, right here in verse 8. You see that? You have to be disciplined. If you are the kind of person that constantly needs someone else railing at you, to do what you have to do, you're not going to make a good pastor. You're going to make a mess out of the congregation that you would hope to serve. 
If you're the kind of person that your wife is constantly gnawing at you to make your bed because you don't make your own bed and you forget to brush your teeth because you're a bit of a slob and you never turn your homework in on time and your professors constantly have to prompt you and you're always going to them, begging for them, please give me an extension, not because my grandpa died or something like that, but because you failed in your own responsibilities, you're not going to be a good pastor. And let me tell you why. Because the deadlines for pastoral ministry are every single Sunday morning at 10.30 or 11 or 8.30 or whatever else your schedule is. And they are absolutely inflexible. If you're not the kind of person that can motivate yourself to do the hard work, studying the text, preparing the sermon, making your outline, writing your manuscript, uh, consigning it to your heart so that you can get in the pulpit with something worthy to say because nobody is there to push you to do that thing, then you are not qualified to be a pastor. Uh, If you're the kind of person that can't manage your health, if you're the kind of person that can't manage your schedule, if you're the kind of person that shows up late all the time because you always have to have some taskmaster leaning over you for you to even perform basic functions, I'm telling you, you're just not going to be a good pastor. You have to be the kind of person that is self-motivated because you know what? When you're a pastor, you may have a board of elders, but they're not going to show up every day to make sure that you clock in on time and that you call the people in your church that are hurting and that you get yourself to the hospital to make your visits and that you prepare diligently for Bible study and the sermon and the service and whatever else you have to do because there are so many demands on the pastor's life that when nobody is there to push you to do these things, there's nobody there cracking the whip when your mom and your wife and your father-in-law, when they're not there to tell you what to do and you have to do it yourself, if you can't do it, there's no way you can do this job. You are absolutely unfit to do this job if you can't be self-motivated. If you can't get yourself up on time, if you can't nourish yourself with three healthy meals a day, if you can't take care of your car problems and your family problems and spend some time with your kids and have some good date time with your wife because your personal life is a wreck, how do you think How do you possibly think that you are going to do any good for the church in managing its affairs when you can't manage yourself? If you are a slacker, please, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but I'm sure there's a good job somewhere else, but the church is not going to serve as that primary place of vocation for you. Uh, If you don't have self-motivated will to do the work of the Lord because you love him and for the good of the church, if you need somebody pressing on you all the time, Uh, please apply elsewhere. Secondly, if you have thin skin, this is not the job for you, okay? Now, it says here that everyone is to be above reproach, which means that your reputation as a godly human being is safeguarded. That doesn't mean that you're not going to be slandered. You probably are going to be slandered, as a matter of fact. The fact that you're above reproach, though, means that no charge can really land on you, okay? It's like uh, throwing a Velcro dart. You ever see one of those things? Against a smooth wall. A Velcro dart doesn't stick to a smooth wall because there's nothing there to adhere, okay? There's nothing there to, to sustain the charge, okay? So it's not that people aren't going to try. They're going to call you all kinds of nasty things, especially the unbelieving world and liberals and progressives and all kinds of activists are out there. They're going to call you every word that they can summon. But none of them will stick to your chest because you are a person who's above reproach. But listen to me. If you can't handle that kind of criticism, then this is not the job for you. I'm, I'm sure that there's a nice job as a mall security guard or something like that where you're not going to get the kind of criticism and critique that you will get in the pastoral ministry. So you have to ask yourself, can I handle that? Because, listen, every single time you preach a sermon, every single time you make a pastoral leadership decision in the life of the church, somebody's probably going to question it. And you know what? As members of the church, they have every right to question it. Your elders have a right to question some of the things that you said from time to time. Your members have a right to question some of the things that you do. Look, a church that's overcritical, hypercritical to their pastor, that's not a that's not a healthy place to be. You don't want to find a church like that where they're constantly nitpicking at you. But you know what? If any criticism is going to pierce your skin because you have the you have paper thin skin, uh, you don't have any kind of wherewithal to sustain Uh, even mild criticism, you're going to fly off the handle, you're going to get self-defensive, you're going to start name-calling back, you're going to rant with two-page long emails telling that person why asking the question was inappropriate in the first place, 
bro, that's not a safe place to be. You had better develop some thick skin before you enter enter the pastoral office. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be eaten up by even the most mild criticism. You know, there's a video online the other day, some Canadian politician, I don't even know who it was, but I watched the clip. It was, you saw this, right? It's that guy, he's calmly, calmly eating an apple while some crazy left-wing reporter tries to ask him all these set up fake questions and he's just munching the apple deflecting every every possible uh mode of advantage that the reporter's trying to get i loved it i thought it was awesome i wish more men were as confidently masculine as that guy i thought that was brilliant and pastors um you have to be able to be self-disciplined enough there it is again or self-controlled there it is again To be able to deflect that kind of criticism, the nonsense criticism, um, just very nonchalantly, if that's a word, if that's a word. And the serious criticism, you have to you have to have the maturity to be able to take it to heart. Next. Uh, Okay, let's go back to self-controlled a little bit here, because this one's going to sting. If you are one of those guys who is an online assassin, you're not going to make it very long in the ministry. If you're the kind of person that gets on Facebook and and has to rant against people, if you are saying idiotic things just because it gets likes and retweets and follows, if you kind of love the controversy of all of it, uh, you like to say slightly rambunctious things just to inspire a little bit of vitriol from your followers or from other people's followers, I, I just don't think you have what it takes to be in ministry. Um, I've seen so many guys do this. And you, you know what? Pastors should be above this kind of nonsense, okay? This online vitriol all the time. What are you doing with your office hours that you, you have time to engage in all of these threads, combating people, trying to fight off every heretic, trying to fight off some of the orthodox people, but you just don't agree with some of their minor viewpoints? Um, there's a certain level of maturity that just says, I'm going to come to the office. I'm going to do my work. I'm going to care for my people. I'm going to try to do a little bit of outreach and and reach the lost and let those stupid online arguments go. Here's a challenge for you. And I want you to take this seriously. Read, um, Paul's letters to Timothy and to Titus and, uh, note the number of times that Paul says that quarreling quarreling is foolish. And then ask yourself, does my online behavior comport with Paul's uh, Paul's mandate there that foolishness is quarreling? You know what? You can leave the nonsense quarreling to those ridiculous Anon accounts on Twitter and on Facebook where they don't even have the courage to post their face and they certainly don't put their real name. There are so many people who run these kind of troll accounts like that. Let, let those people do the nonsense quarreling. But if you're going to be a man of God and your face is going to be on the masthead of your church's website and your name is going to be in the bulletin representing that church in your denomination, you better at least have the wherewithal to not get dragged into those nonsense type of arguments that take place online. Now, somebody may say, "Ah, but Everhard, you've had a couple of engagements with people online, especially related to certain topics that may be controversial. Fair enough. And I regret it. I have made some mistakes and I've tried to apologize to the people that may have maybe I've gone over the line with. But for the most part, I have tried to make sure that this channel is a constructive channel in which I don't spend a lot of my time chasing down heretics. Now, it's true that I will get on the worshiptainment crowd a little bit from time to time, but only because I think that they're totally debasing the whole concept of public worship. Other than that, though, When you see pastors and they're like 52 lines into some ridiculous thread arguing about this or that or this other controversial person over here, man, you just got to be mature, step over that, move across that, and just do the work that your church pays you to do. If you can't promise to do that, you're not fit for the pastoral ministry. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm just telling you how it is. Next, and this is my last one here, brother... If, if you can't get the doggone pornography under control, please, by all means, spare us all the pain and don't apply for pastoral ministry. Listen, um, straight talk here. Every man is going to struggle with temptation. Every single man is going to struggle with temptation. 
And unfortunately, the world that we live in today is just rife with the most sick and disgusting type of entrapments out there. That's why the Proverbs so constantly talk about sin as like a snare. Do you know what a snare is? <clears throat> it's when you set up a trap that springs and captures an animal by the neck and basically hangs it to death until it dies. That's what a snare is. Pornography is a snare. If you can't stay away from the porn, please, please stay out of the pulpit. Okay, You have to have self-control as a man. You have to be in the fight. And if you're not winning the fight by the help of the Holy Spirit, if you are by, if you are beset by pornography, there's got to be some point in your life in which you grow out of that nonsense. You're not a 17-year-old boy anymore. You're a 30-year-old man, for goodness sakes. Don't you love your wife more than you love that ridiculous screen? Don't you love the holiness of God more than you love that ridiculous act that you're watching? I think it's absolutely disgusting. Look at this here. A man who is set to be an elder must be upright and holy. Does that mean he's perfect in all of his ways? Does that mean he's beyond temptation anymore? No, that's not what the word holy means here. But it does mean that you better be in the fight against pornography and you better be winning that fight as well, too, all right? Uh, again, if you are beset by this particular sin, uh, there's a reason why pornography, pornography is freakish. It's because it is a complete distortion of human sexuality and marriage. There is no reason why a porn addict should be regularly in a pulpit preaching and teaching to the people of God. If you can't get that under control, again, one more time, I'm going to highlight it one more time, self-control. If by the help of the Holy Spirit, you cannot get your pornography addiction under control. Please, by all means, do something else. Go work at Wendy's. Go work at Walmart. Uh, go serve who knows where. But uh, you're not qualified to be in the pastoral office if you are a porn addict. All right? Sorry for the intensity of this particular video, but I do love you lots. And we'll talk to you later.